So that was bad. Okay, so what I have on my screen right here is the results of an open SOLIDWORKS simulation. And hopefully what you can tell is I have this bounding box, which defines the volume of the simulation. And then I have some solid body inside that box where it's doing the calculations. So in the example in last class, it used the internal void on the inside of a part to calculate the volume that it was going to do the analysis in. In this case, I just specify, hey, here's a box of this size, flow some fluid through that box with whatever parameters we want to flow that fluid with, and then calculate how the fluid moves around the body um, and gives us various parameters. We use for like lift calculations, drag calculations, it can be aerodynamic or hydrodynamic. Um, and there are some issues there. One thing that I've noticed, and I don't know if this is just my uh, incorrect interpretation, is that you're supposed to be able to cut these planes in half to do symmetric analysis. But I have noted that in my simulation results, if I look at the forces inside here, uh, let's just do show all real quick. I get an X force of 14 Newtons. And really, if this is symmetric and the flow is going just kind of from head to tail on the airplane, there shouldn't really be an X force on this body. And even if I go and if I change the boundary on this, so I can edit the domain. So that way my X goes, so non-symmetric just default to one point or negative, sorry, negative 1.264. I'm just making it symmetric, the close to symmetric. And then I rerun this analysis. I should have done a screenshot or something like that. And I've set this up to run fairly quickly just so I don't have to waste much time while you guys are watching. Um, but again, you can set this to be more accurate with a finer mesh and it will take longer to solve. Or if you have more complex geometry or you can make the bounding box bigger, all those different things. So I'll show that flow analysis again. So you can see there's the whole thing with the entire plane in there. Um, the coloring here represents the pressures. And if I show you the goals, You notice on this one, the X force is, you know, it's not zero, but it's close to zero. Um, and the Y force is, it looks like it's about double. So maybe they're just assuming that, hey, I'm just gonna do the calculations for half of it. Just assume that the other half is double whatever you get, which I guess kind of works, but it's annoying to me because I would expect SOLIDWORKS to do the multiplication for the symmetry for me, rather than having me have to do it offline. But I, I don't know. Um, there may be some box I have to check for that. Uh, it's, just a, it's just a quirk that I wanted to bring up before we got too far into this. Yeah, Owen. I have the plane online from a previous example. We're actually not going to use the plane for ours just for the sake of simplicity. So we can if you want to, but we'll just use it as something simple to model it out. All right, so let's go ahead and make a part that we're going to use for doing our simulation. And I actually want a very simple part for this. And so I'm just going to make uh, a wing. If you, if you all want to use just a ball or uh, some oblong shape or any geometry that you want, it'll be interesting for us to not all have the exact same simulation results for every single submission. Um, I'm going to go to the right plane. I'm going to sketch. And I'm just going to try and get a reasonable profile for a wing. So I'm going to have a trailing circle. And then I'm going to use an arc that comes off of it. So I want to use a tangent arc. I may not be able to do that with this tool. And I'm going to use a three-point arc. So I'll do an arc that kind of comes across, something like that. And I'll make that tangent with the top line. And then I'm going to make a bottom line that just goes across the bottom of the wing. And I'm going to make these two coincident. And I'm going to trim out side. And I'm just going to give it some length. So let's say, uh, yeah, 160 millimeters. That's fine. It's 16 centimeters. And I'll give it some initial angle here. Uh, I think I can do that just with my three points. So we'll say that angle here is 20. 
not a very good wing profile because you really don't want to have a like perfectly circular cross section for a wing, but it works. If you guys want to use a triangle, if you just want to use a box, if you want to use something else, doesn't matter. Give yourself some kind of geometry. And then I'm going to extrude this out. So I'm going to go into features, extrude boss base. I'm going to use a mid-plane extrude. And I'm going to make it, let's say, 50 millimeters wide. I can use the open body simulation with any solid body. It does not like voids inside your parts. So if you have like complex assemblies that have uh, like open geometry in the middle of the part, it or like you know a big like a cup or something, it's not going to like that very well. It's going to be hard for it to simulate that. Um, but whenever you have a closed envelope, it's going to do a pretty good job of simulating the results of that kind of a geometry. Everyone have a geometry or very close to having a geometry? It doesn't need to be fully defined, just needs to be something. And the orientation doesn't really matter either. We'll see the results and then we can change the, the, the wing or the whatever it is and observe a change in the parameters of the system. We're good? All right, so I'm going to save this part. I'm just going to save it to desktop under fluid flow. I'm just going to call it wing. I'm going to make sure that my flow simulation add-in is uh, toggled on. And then I'm going to go over to flow simulation and we'll walk through the wizard on how to set up the flow simulation for an open geometry. Anyone have any questions? We need me to kind of take a pause for a second before we continue. This is where we're going to start our flow analysis. I'm going to go into the wizard. I'm just going to click on the wizard button. It's going to ask for me to specify, uh, I think it starts with unit systems, which is just whatever unit system you want to use. I guess we need a name first. I'm just call it wing. Wing next. So here I can use kilogram, uh, center, centimeter, gram second, foot pound second, inch pound second, Newton millimeters. If I want to use foot pound second, that's fine. You also don't have to use like a default combination. So say you're like me and you like MMGS, but you hate Pascals because Pascals are super tiny. I could go and I can just change just Pascals to, um, yeah, I got mega pascals or something on here. Your mega pascals, just so I don't have tiny units of force or of uh, pressure and stress. So you can change just one or two of those if you like. Um, another common one that I see people change uh, when everything else is the same is just like angles. So if you want angles in degrees instead of radians, you can do stuff like that too. Uh, so here, if you want to change angle to degree, you know, whatever unit systems you want. If you want to set your unit systems there, there's something that you can use. Last time we looked at internal analysis, now we're gonna do external analysis. The options down here are largely the same. Uh, if you want to exclude internal cavities, you can click on that button. So if you have an object that is hollow, but doesn't have any openings to the outside, so it's a closed hollow body, then you can do that. Uh, if you want to have a fluid analysis with an open hollow body, you can still do that. It's just going to be a complex analysis because it's going to have lots of kind of vortexing and stuff like that around those openings. So, and then if you want to, you can have different time dependencies, gravity, rotation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just going to skip that. I'm going to use gas as air for my simulation. These are all just predefined. Um, you can get more details on each of these. Remember when I bring in the, uh, the full list of properties. Here. So here's the list of all of the different locations and stuff like that. 
uh, materials, gases, uh, predefined, here's air. So you can get air at different temperatures. You can get density, specific heats, all those different kinds of things. So there's lots of details now that you can go and you can get out if you want to. I got to that by hitting the new button. There's probably another way of getting to it too, but I'm sure where else to get to it. We can go next. Uh, I'm not gonna worry about surface roughness. If you wanna make surface roughness on there, you can add that. And then this is probably the biggest difference between doing an interior flow analysis and an exterior flow analysis. In the interior flow analysis, the velocity parameters are not really that important because you're gonna specify the inlet and outlet conditions. In the external analysis, you need to have something that's happening in this external volume for you to get some kind of a result. So in this case, if I wanna mo model the movement of air going across the wing profile I've created, I need to specify a velocity of the kind of global air stream going past my part. So in this case, I've got kind of the tip, I'm gonna move this over so we can see it. Uh, I can't zoom out because of the things in the way. <laughs> There you go. I've got the tip of my wing coming in the z direction. So I probably want to have velocity in the negative z direction. So I'm going to take this, I'll make this like negative 50 meters per second. Or I can use negative 100. And it shows me on my diagram at the origin of my part the direction of the velocity vector that I type in there. You can also make these parameters functions. So if you want to make it a function of something else, uh, you can have multiple things going in the same time as part of these parameters so you can iterate the studies and perform multiple kind of uh, flow analyses under different conditions if you had a model where you wanted to change something and run the analysis and change something and run the analysis and change something and run the analysis then that's probably how you would want to facilitate that as opposed to doing it manually every single time right so you can go through and you can change those as well for now, I'm just going to have a constant velocity in the z direction. I'll hit finish. You guys bring me over to the uh, SOLIDWORKS. It's not the CAM tree, uh, but it's the flow sim tree. It's just the labels are showing up wrong. Um, the last thing I need to do on here, since I've already specified the flow conditions, I can actually run this. The problem is I don't want to run it now because I'm not calculating anything of interest. And so only thing you'll get out of that is the plots that I can generate after the fact. If I actually want to know something about this profile, and most of the time you're looking for like, you know, what is the total amount of drag or what is the lift or some property like that in this kind of analysis, you need to specify a global goal. Yeah, Owen. Your model is not watertight. <laughs> you an internal analysis or an external analysis? Yeah, so if you don't have if you have, if you don't have like a void uh, inside the part, won't do the internal analysis. So if you want to do the internal analysis, go back and look at the lectures from uh, from Monday. Uh, I can probably show you where that is in the wizard real quick. We just go next. So this internal and external, we're doing external currently. You can also bring that dialog back up if you right click on the input data in this tree under wing, and then go to general settings, and then you can change it here. And then you have like the various kind of speeds and conditions over here on the right. It's not the exact same menus as in the wizards, but it's pretty similar. Your fluids and stuff like that, All right? So we've got our air. <clears throat> All right, so I need to specify a goal on here. Global goals are probably gonna be your default go-to. Uh, on something like this, I definitely want to know what the forces on this object are. So I'm going to scroll down here to force X, Y, Z, turn all those on. And then I can also look at things like pressures. So if I want to know the surface pressures, I can look at surface and I can look for maybe maximum pressure on top, bottom, side surfaces. 
And most of these are pretty intuitive. So, you know, if there's something you want to calculate that's reasonable to pull out of a flow simulation, there's going to be an option to be able to do that. Does anyone have any questions on setup? Because at this point, we've got all the setup done for the uh, external flow analysis. The last thing I want to consider before we run is, do we have an appropriate volume? In this case, we do. So I'm going to go ahead and run it. But then when we come back in, we'll see how long this takes. And we'll see, OK, well, with that results, if we wanted to run it again. Can we refine it to make it faster to calculate? Let's go ahead and run. So I'm going to hide that again. Again, I'm going to do a new calculation. I'm always going to do a new calculation on these. There are situations where you do want to do a continued calculation, but I don't like them. I don't trust it. Notice this does take a while for it to run. I can look at uh, my values that I'm calculating over time and see if they're kind of converging, diverging, moving. I probably picked a bad example. This is the X direction. I do expect this to be close to zero. I'm gonna look at my drag. Uh, drag is gonna be in the Z. I didn't actually click the box. Click the box, okay. So there's my uh, drag. As it started off high and then kind of came back down and stabilized, right now it's it's pretty low. We're not moving that fast, and this is a pretty small part, so that makes sense. And I can look at my lift. So I can go same kind of thing there. You can also leave those open. You don't have to close them each time. But if you leave it open and then go to do something else, it's going to kind of stack and stack and stack and stack, and you'll get a bunch of windows open, and you'll kind of kill your memory. memory. Um, I can also plot kind of the, the results as they're coming in. So uh, I don't know which plane is the right plane on this one, but I can go to pressure in the front plane. That's not the plane that I want. If I want the right plane. Let's do the right plane. And I can see how the pressure uh, is changing as it goes through various iterations as it tries to optimize this model. And you can see I've got an increase of pressure on kind of the, the tip of the wing, which makes sense. Um, a little bit of a lower pressure following that. I can't really tell if there is a significant decrease in pressure as it goes over the top quarter of the wing. There should be a little bit of a decrease. It's gonna have to speed up to go over that top piece. And so, you know, the Bernoulli's principle is supposed to say, as the fluid speeds up, its velocity increases, its pressure should decrease. And that's one of the ways that we get lift from a wing. And you'll note that this is taking a while to run compared to the one I did before, which was a much more complicated geometry, but I had changed the conditions of the boundary to allow it to run faster. You could argue that running faster on a more complex geometry is inherently a bad idea. It means that my results for that complex geometry were probably not very good. Um, but that's one of the things you want to watch out for in these simulations is that a lot of times you can make a complicated model run fast or an uncomplicated model run slow. And you're going to get really good results for the uncomplicated model and really bad results for the complicated model. If you want to get good results, you need to scale the computational time proportionally to some extent with the complexity of the model. So I want to get reasonable results on this one that we're doing together. And so I was leaving it at the defaults. We'll go in and we'll refine that a little bit so we can run it faster here in a minute. And you can notice that this is not changing very much as we go further and further into the simulation, right? Mm -hmm. Any, any questions? Doing good, doing bad, not sad, something, something. Solver is finished. Now it's done. I can close all this stuff. All the data is going to be saved in here. And the way I review the results is more or less the same as I did in the closed analysis. I have all these different options. Probably most importantly, I care about the goal plots. And I like to just to show these. You can plot them as a function of the iteration or the function of time. If you want to do a, a time variant study, or if you want to have a number of other things, you can do that. Um, but most of the time we care about is just what these values are. So uh, in this case, I had a, uh, a lift force of 1.06, and I had a drag force of 0.57. So 
So lift over drag of two, not very good. It would not be a good wing design. But you can see the analysis. I could change the wing to try and get a better lift over drag ratio to get a better wing performance, right? Is that the goal plot? Oh, how do I get this thing up? So come down where it says goal plots and then do insert. And then I'm just clicking on all and then clicking on show. And it gives me the summary. If I want to look at like the actual plot, there's the actual plots. And this is what it'll do if you actually click on the goal plot after you've looked at it. Because these iterations are really just the model itself resolving and not really changing anything inside the model, it, I don't, it's not valuable for me to look at these plots because really they're all just converging at the final values. If I was looking at this not versus iteration, but versus time or something and doing a time dependent analysis, then these plots would be more interesting. So you've got that. You've also got your flow trajectories. So I can insert those. Um, you can specify a specific area you want for these. Uh, or you can just use a plane. So I can insert those. I can see what those look like. I can make those denser if I want to. So if I just want to have uh, more lines, I don't think it really cares how many you do. You can get more lines in there. You can also change the size of the lines if you want them to be bigger or smaller or whatever. And then this one, since this is mostly two-dimensional, I probably don't really need to be doing this as a three-dimensional analysis. Um, and I'm mostly interested in doing a cut plane uh, going through the length of this. So if I cut this across the right plane, I can look at uh, pressure contours. And so you can see the pressure differential. If I hide my flow directories, you can probably see that a little bit better. You can see I do give a slightly decreased pressure region across the top. I also have a little bit of a decreased pressure region right here after the nose. So that's kind of where I'm getting that lift. And I'm, I'm guessing that the geometry that I have is not very good. I probably should have it get uh, a little bit bigger towards the front and then taper down more slowly towards the backside. So I don't have as much kind of frontage area right here. But that's what that looks like. Any questions on any of these kind of visualizations or numbers or how to get those out? You can also drag these around. So if you want to move your plot and see what the variation as a function of cross section looks like, you can do that. Even values. You can flip and have multiple directions. You can show multiple directions at the same time, all the good stuff. All right, let me hide that. Let's take a look at the computational domain. So the main way I'm going to make this uh, faster is by changing the resolution of the mesh or the size of the computational domain. If I can make the size of the computational domain smaller, it's going to run faster. So the easiest thing to do here is just to essentially shrink my domain. So that way it has the area of interest and not a bunch of extra things. I will note that if you make this too small, you will not get valid results because you need to have room in here for any variance and pressure around your object to stabilize. So if you've got a big variance of pressure at the top of that domain, it's not going to calculate properly. You're going to get weird results. Um, and I've tried it. You can't like cut it in half and get a good simulation with just half the part. Uh, the flows exit the domain at the top, and then you don't get any of the pressures and stuff like that you would get out of there. So we can make this a little bit smaller. Uh, most of the time, your trailing edge can be fairly short. Or sorry, your, your leading edge can be fairly short, and your trailing edge needs to be a little bit longer. And it's valuable to have this be somewhat symmetric. Oh, I just shrunk it way too down. So that's the first thing I can change. And I can also change the meshing conditions. So if I come down here to mesh, this is option for global mesh. And it'll show me kind of a uh, level of detail. I want to show the basic mesh. This grid kind of overlays how large each of the voxels um, it's going to have when it's doing its analysis. Now, it will subdivide 
those boxes, if it sees uh, more geometry turbulence effects in that region. So it's important that when you look at this analysis, you want to set this to a size that is not super small, but also not super big. If it's super big, it's going to have to rerun the analysis more times because it's going to want to try and resolve that by subdividing the initial message. If I make it really small, it's going to have to do a bunch of calculations on areas that are fairly stable that it wouldn't have had to do that for. So it's kind of a trade-off between the number of iterations the simulation has to run um, versus how long each iteration takes. And if each iteration takes forever, that doesn't help. And you have to do a million iterations, that also doesn't help. There's no real good, hey, this is the amount. Um, this ratio factor, it will allow us to change uh, kind of the relative sizing. And so notice here that when I do that, it is adjusting the size of the boxes based off of the geometry. So if you want to make this, I don't know how big I can go. Um, let's say 10. You guys see what it's doing there? It's making the geometry more accurate next to my part and less accurate as I move away from the part. Generally, that works pretty well. You don't want to go too nuts with that because you'll get really inaccurate results like right here above the wing because I've made those ones so big compared to the rest of the part. Um, I don't know what a best value, best case value is on here. There's probably not a singular best case value for a generic set of geometries. Um, but it seems like things between three and four work pretty well for me. So if I go to four, that kind of optimizes my voxel sizes across the cross section of what I'm looking at. And then we'll just to compare it, we'll run this again. We'll see qualitatively what the processing time difference looks like. I don't know, it probably took maybe a few, few minutes the first time I did it. You see every time, every time that, that calculation bar kind of comes back down is it's subdividing at least one of those pieces, but now it's done. So it's faster. I don't know how much faster, but faster. And our results are probably pretty similar. Okay. Maybe a little bit more accurate because I got a little bit more density here. So this is a zero angle of attack. Basically, I don't have any tilt to this wing. So I want to look and see, okay, well, if I change this design, so that way I get more lift and more drag, it's pretty easy to go into my model. Come back here to the model, go to my first extrude. And then, yeah, I know there's no solid objects. Make that so it's not. Ooh, I never specifies the size. <laughs> Let me specify the size of this leading edge. Because otherwise it's going to scale and we're going to be totally off base with what our previous ones. But I can drag this out. So I hope I can drag it out. Let's do this. Uh, make this vertical relational. I want that one. Yes. I want to get rid of the vertical relation. There you go. Now I should be able to drag the tail of this down a little bit. So same geometry, I've just tilted it up a little bit. I'll go back over to my simulation. I probably need to change my computational domain. It looks like it automatically updated it based off my change. I'm going to make it a little bit closer to what I had before just so I can run it a little faster. You need to be a little bit taller because I, I made the model taller. And then I'm going to look at my mesh inside that. So I'm just going to show it. Yeah, that's okay. I don't know if I can still see my results on here. Before I go to the next one. So this is my results from last time. I had a uh, drag force of 0.9 and a lift force of 1.7. 
I rewritten this. Which was like, you know, it's like a drag to lift ratio of two, right? Twice the lift per unit drag. This should give us a, a, a higher drag force and a higher lift force, but probably my ratio of lift to drag will be worse. At least that's what I expect for this. So here, my lift force is now 2.6. My drag force is uh, one. So actually my lift to drag ratio got better, um, but both of the values did go up. Just the drag didn't go up by very much. And it's probably because I went from having this top edge, having a, you know, a frontal area to not having a frontal area. So my, my total cross-sectional area from this standpoint of the wind stream didn't change very much. And I just have more of that trailing edge. And we can see what that looks like in our cut plot. You can see that the magnitude and the area of the low pressure region on the top of the wing is now much larger. The pressure on the bottom wing didn't really change very much. And we can show our flow trajectories as well. And it's probably a little too much to actually be able to see it, but we can play that out. Such fun. Questions on anything in terms of this uh, external flow simulation? This is with air, doing with water is literally just shaking a button for water instead of air. Um, you know, it's gonna automatically try and predict whether you have turbulent or laminar flow. So you don't have to worry about that. You do need to worry that the inputs you're using in terms of velocity, sizes, et cetera, are appropriate for your model, but works pretty good. No questions? I'm gonna stop recording. I'm gonna try and stop recording. <laughs>